Okay, so we are a group of international students at the Astronomical Observatory of the Aguilonian University. So we conduct this uh, public outreach program before we used to conduct in our observatory. But as you know, due to the global pandemic uh, reasons and then safety decree, so we are making this uh, virtual uh, presentation or kind of a, uh, outreach on uh, Facebook or social media. So here, uh, basically this is just a very brief dis uh, discussion about how telescopes uh, 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 was uh, in the advent of uh, in the advent of astronomy. So I hope y uh, all the listeners and watchers are having a very good weekend. So I would just start off with my um, presentation. So uh, I'm Karthik uh, Bala Subramanian. I, I, I'm a PhD research scholar at the uh, Yagilonian Observatory. So. What do you, uh, what do you, uh, you may have all uh, come across about different, different hist historical uh, uh, reasons of why astronomy would have uh, was begun, but mostly, mostly this astronomy is one of the oldest fields in uh, uh, in science, uh, in our science to understand the nature. So out of out of many of the cultures, the most uh, one of uh, some of the most oldest civilizations that actually contributed for its uh, vast uh, uh, knowledge was uh, as uh, as uh, as uh, as you're able to see it's some of uh, some of the oldest civilizations like Mesopotamian, in Indian, Greece, and Hellenistic uh, civilizations uh, or Egyptian. Chinese, uh, Mesoamerican, and uh, medieval Mi Middle Eastern civilizations. So you can see there is actually um, a chart of on on the uh, on one of the pharaoh's tomb in Egypt. It's basically the calendar of um, twelve uh, you know twelve seasons, and similarly. You have um, uh, on on below uh, below this uh, image. You have another image of uh, of a similar uh, 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 similar uh, similar structure uh, or painting or by uh, Chinese uh, uh, historians. And then uh, on the left, you have. Uh, the the painting in uh, which was found in the uh, uh, position of seven planets in 9th century AD in Leiden and uh, on the right you have the obs uh, the observatory uh, temple at at uh, El Charcoal in Mexico so why Mesopotamian uh, astronomical uh, uh, contribution is very important. So they were one of the oldest, oldest uh, uh, cultures which contributed to the uh, vast knowledge of astronomy. So, for example, they had, they were the ones uh, uh, who started the segma, seg, decimal numeral system. That means uh, we have this uh, concept of uh, time, angles, and geographical coordinates. This was actually their invention. Sim uh, similarly, uh, similarly, the modern practice of dividing the circle into 360 degrees and an hour into the 60 minutes was also by their culture. So you can actually, this was well tabulated in Enuma and Enlil. Uh, we, and also a Venus tablet in Ami Saduka, which were the uh, which had the last visible risings of Venus over over a period of 21 years, and this was documented, and it was a periodic uh, uh, documentation uh, by them. And uh, on the right, as you see, this is uh, one of the findings where inscriptions where it's about. Uh, 
the observation of Halley's comet in 164 BC. So, so they used to daily record the observations of moons and planets from 7th century. So uh, they have also seen, uh, respectively even given the uh, by uh, they have also given the date by uh, time chronology. Okay, so and also the uh, Sel uh, Sel Seleucus of Seleucia uh, was a notable Babylonian astronomer who also supported heliocentric model. This is very, very surprising because this was like more than more th uh, mo uh, 1,200 uh, years before Christ. And this also paved the way for other cultures like Gre uh, Greek civilizations, and uh, s similarly the uh, the share uh, the the sharing of knowledge between Indian Indus uh, Valley civilizations and uh, Sassanian civilization Byzantinum, and in and also in Islamic uh, civilizations. This paved the way for these other. Uh, astronomy from these cultures. So, how Greek astronomy uh, kind of uh, contributed for uh, one one of the most important uh, how it kind of contributed in the history of astronomy. You can see that uh, on the right, uh, you see that uh, anti kethera uh, mechanism was some kind of an analog computer in which was designed in. 150 100 BC, it was uh, used to calculate the position of astronomical objects. And Aristotle, who was one of a great philosopher and a uh, scientist and a thinker of that uh, of that era, proposed you know uh, of uh, you know uh, of a more theological and epistemological um, idea of uh, universe. And uh, so they had a. Uh, he he described that our universe is made of complex system of concentric spheres, whose circular motions combine to carry the planets around the Earth. So, this was one of the uh, model that prevailed till the early 16th century. And similarly, uh, you can also know that Ptolemy of uh, of Alexandria compressed uh, all the all the uh, uh, all all the uh, all the findings that was done till then from the ba early Babylonians and Mesopotamians and uh, they he gave a he gave a model of cosmology devil um, and um, this was something which paved the paved uh, the way to most of the early Roman and um, medieval uh, early uh, Roman uh, uh, astronomy up to medieval uh, era. So they uh, they they had they they had a very good concept of uh, what um, what was the s uh, central. Uh, origin or cosmogony of the of our universe for example w from where did the stars planets come from and how they were created so similarly this was this uh, this uh, knowledge was passed down to medieval uh, medieval middle eastern arabs and other uh, cultures in in that uh, in that uh, uh, geographical area and they also contributed a lot for the uh, uh, astronomy, as you see on the right. There is um, there is a uh, astro astrolabium in, uh, in which was uh, made in twelve uh, uh, twelve uh, tw uh, one thousand two hundred eight in the year. Uh, so this they they could uh, calculate the Earth Sun's distance that which is the one astronomical unit and then what is the sun's circumference and 
how um, uh, other other such parameters and how that uh, and they also proved that moonlight is ref is uh, nothing but reflected sunlight and uh, moon is not um, a self luminant source so similarly i also uh, took some time to look into classical indian astronomy which was uh, also around uh, 1400 bc old uh, so this i just cr I try to just um, uh, tr summarize in few uh, few uh, paragraphs basically on the right you on the right end you see this is basically the calendar uh, in in uh, Indian system, which follows Ved, uh, which follows uh, from the Vedanga Jyotisha. So basically, Vedas is the culminar uh, culmination of all knowledge in the Indian uh, subcontinent uh, uh, method of learning, and uh, basically. Vedanga Jyotisha is nothing but the auxiliary disciplines of Vedas, so which was uh, written somewhere around um, around 700 600 to 600 BC. So this uh, in Indian astronomy was highly influenced by Greek astronomy because that was a time when the uh, Alexander the Great uh, tried to con uh, try to uh, conquer the Middle East and I uh, reached up to the the Hindu Kush mountains in the fourth century BC. So at that was time where uh, there were very simultaneous exchange of ideas. So where it paved a way to uh, bring more um, uh, more um, um, rational ideas of uh, astronomy. Uh, so, you can you can find this uh, uh, in the text of Aryabhatta, uh, uh, Aryabhatta, which was written by Aryabhatta in the fifth, sixth century A.D., and uh, which was one of the pinnacle uh, uh, of astronomical knowledge of at the time. B uh, and similarly, this influenced uh, other uh, astronomy uh, astronomy from other uh, uh, cultures, from Muslims or Chinese or even European astronomy. So you can, if, 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 uh, if those who are interested uh, after listening to this, they can actually look into the, the history of astronomy, uh, which is uh, given in the uh, references. So yeah, so uh, now uh, coming to the, the medieval modern astronomy, so you have heliocentric model where uh, which was revolutionized by uh, Nicholas Copernicus which which uh, was more like a, a very big foundation for the modern uh, 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 modern science and uh, cosmo uh, cos uh, which uh, which paved the way for astronomy and cosmology as in together so where you on the right you can see this uh, sun at the center and then the earth is re revolving around so this is this ends basically the the uh, history of astronomy and now i will move to telescopes so basically what are telescopes so telescopes are uh, basically the instruments to study light and and infer what the light is trying to tell the observer so you collect light and then you also uh, uh, the another uh, important uh, uh, task is to provide good angular resolution so one of the telescope we have is our human eye so uh, eye is a, a natural biological telescope which has an aperture of 0.5 centimeter square and it has 0.1 second time resolution so uh, for example you uh, a vera bright star emits around something like 1 million photons per centimeters 
square uh, uh, centimeter square per second so you see around about you know 10 to the power of 5 photons continuously from this star this is just an example and uh, and similarly the faintest naked eye stars are about like 300 times fainter so you see about 300 photons continuously from these stars like so it is just basically uh, depends on the number uh, the 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 coefficient and similarly uh, 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 if you if you have if you have a telescope of a diameter d and then then has an it has an aperture of uh, pi d square by 4 uh, per centimeter square uh, uh, centimeter square so it's a collecting area basically so if your aperture is larger than uh, larger then you collect more light so uh, if, if if the aperture is larger than that of your eye then more uh, more uh, light is kind of concentrated on, on the eye and faint the object uh, faint object looks much brighter uh, a six inch telescope that is the focal length basically collects about 900 times as much as the naked eye and then for example uh, one of the optical telescope get, uh, which is a 10 meter telescope uh, collects around that is the aperture is 10 meter so it collects uh, 3 into 10 power 6 that is almost uh, that is 1 million times than the the naked eye so bigger is better so now what is angular resolution so it is in it is inverse inversely proportional to the diameter of the telescope and it's directly proportional to the wavelength of the light so is um, uh, it's ability uh, it basically angular resolution is the ability to separate two nearby objects so Again here, bigger is the better for the angular resolution, but the more uh, higher the angular resolution is kind of limited by the atmosphere. Uh, okay. So here on this uh, uh, image, you see two stars which are separated by 0.25 arc second. So uh, these stars are uh, resolve uh, are uh, resolved uh, for for them to be resolved you need high angular resolution and then uh, basically you have this diffraction uh, uh, rings or it's more like the rings uh, uh, you have this uh, wavefront uh, structures when you throw for example, on a still water, you throw a stone, you have these uh, ripples, right? So similarly, these are uh, diffraction, uh, similar diffraction rings. So it it, it demonstrates that uh, light has a wave nature. So now coming to the types of optical telescopes. So light can be focused in two ways, either by lenses or mirrors. So a refracting telescope. So, refracting telescope as a lens, uh, as a primary object, uh, objective, uh, 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 part of the thing, and then you, ha uh, it, uh, which is the one which focuses the light from the source uh, to the observer. So, as you see here, there is an eyepiece lens on near the the uh, near the observer's eye and then you have the the uh, another bigger uh, bigger lens which is uh, needed for to focus and collimate the light so the light from the source from any star or any um, any kind of il illuminating source uh, comes from infinity or basically from whatever distance then it gets then it hits the objective lens 
it, it bends and then uh, at the edges and it bends and then uh, you, you this is the focal point and then to actually kind of um, collimate it back to the observer side so there's another eyepiece lens here so this uh, refracting telescope was actually patented by Hans Lippershey who is a, who's a Dutch astronomer in 1608. Surprisingly it's not Galileo who was patented for this but Galileo was uh, Galileo Galilei uh, the Italian astronomer and scientist is the one who improved this telescope. So. Um, uh, you see that this is a, a real telescope uh, Earth's which is 14 inch aperture so basically it has um, you know starlight at the objective lens it focuses at the focal point and then you have another eye, uh, eyepiece lens and uh, the, uh, which is kind of collimated to the observer's eye and then th you have another telescope which is the reflecting type of telescope where you use mirrors to reflect light so here you use two mirrors or one mirror uh, and a lens which is ne for which is necessary for to fo focus and collimate the light so the light which comes from from the source starlight it hits the objective mirror and then it hits the diagonal mirror which is like basically kept at particular angle and then it hits the eyepiece for collimating it to the observer's eye. So uh, the reflecting type of telescope was uh, invented by Isaac New uh, Newton who is also a uh, very pioneer and father of mo modern astronomy and science and here you can see that uh, the Keck observatory on the right so you see that there is uh, uh, you see the uh, the image on the on the left basically the uh, you have this uh, the light coming uh, starlight coming uh, hitting the primary mirror and then it hits uh, the pr uh, prime focus if you keep another uh, lens here or uh, basically to collimate to the uh, to the uh, observer's eyepiece so what is the advantages of reflectors so you mirrors uh, you know need only one good surface and mirrors do not need to be transparent here and because in whereas in case of uh, refractors you need them to be transparent at both edges and you need two s two surfaces and here mirrors can be uh, in the reflectors you can see that they can be supported at one end and then uh, reflectors can, uh, can be folded and also made short based on the adjustment so it's easier to po easier to carry around so it's much e uh, good to po uh, for po portable activity and so now uh, based on the two types of uh, telescopes refractor and reflecting you have uh, two different types of mounts telescope mounts so one is the equatorial mount another is altitude azimuth so uh, so now let's talk about the newtonian uh, telescope foci focal uh, fo focal uh, fo foci or focus um, and uh, how it how it's actually improved so the Cassegrain mode is th the one where you you have um, uh, basically the starlight hitting the primary mirror but the here the primary mirror at the center has 
a, 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 a protrusion sorry ex, uh, not a protrusion an extrusion so here the the light which hits off the edges reflects on the secondary mirror and then it reflects back to the and then it gets focused at this uh, particular place or there is also another mo way where if 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 this uh, secondary mirror is kept at an angle you can focus the li uh, the final light out of the telescope at this uh, particular angle or this particular configuration and uh, crude is another kind of um, uh, configuration where it's on the low uh, on the uh, lower half of the telescope so basically you uh, here uh, in the Newtonian and code configuration you don't have an extrusion at the primary mirror uh, so here the starlight hits the primary mirror and then it reflects off the secondary mirror and then then you have another collimator uh, kept uh, or uh, basically kept not a collimator it's uh, it's a di uh, diffractor uh, uh, kept at a particular angle to focus it out of the uh, the telescope uh, case so now we will uh, see some observatories so most uh, uh, another important uh, another interesting and important thing is that most of the optical telescopes or even uh, uh, even uh, these sites are more on the hilltops and there is a reason for that because as you know uh, there is um, more light pollution and uh, human activity which uh, on the on the plateau which affects the telescope function and its efficiency and similarly the atmosphere is more thinner on the higher altitudes so mountain top observatories what are the what are the advantages of the mountain top observatories so it decreases the atmospheric absorption and also you uh, at the high altitudes you have very less water vapor so basically uh, you have more exposure of the visible uh, electromagnetic spectrum so on the bottom you see this is basically the the electromagnetic spectrum on uh, versus the altitude level from sea level up to the atmosphere uh, so you you see that radio radio frequencies or radio wave bands can reach even the sea level very easily but the the um, uh, the infrared uh, kind of uh, don't have that much frequency compared to uh, I mean it has higher frequency but its wavelengths uh, its wave uh, it has a shorter wavelength uh, for which the it, it most of most of this uh, radiation is absorbed in a uh, kind of not, not kind of absorbed but it it, it, it is in uh, interacted with the medium basically the atmospheric medium and uh, as you see below uh, the uh, y you don't you don't have any chance of getting the higher frequency radiation that is the gamma x-rays or uv so which is all uh, obscured uh, and they don't reach they don't travel be uh, below uh, be uh, below uh, 10 kilometer uh, from the sea level uh, it's only the visible and the radio light which actually uh, reaches a sea level, a sea level or the ground level. So mountain top observatories helps you 
uh, helps you improve your scene or observation or angular resolution it helps you mitigate uh, against light pollution as i said as you see on the left you have a picture uh, in 1908 where you had very less uh, urban settlements but in on the right you have 1988 where you have so many so much urban settlements that it kind of it has a very big halo of the human uh, the, the the light produced by human settlement and other possibilities is to have telescopes uh, uh, which are atmosphere based telescopes so some something like sophia so where you have where you have uh, aeroplanes which uh, hover uh, around uh, uh, 10 kilometer above sea level so you have um, over uh, around 10 kilometer above sea level where you have it's uh, where you have exposure to other wavelengths of uh, e uh, electromagnetic spectrum so another possibility is to have telescopes which are uh, space based so they are above the uh, earth's atmosphere so they are in space they are uh, basically geocentric uh, uh, satellites mounted in geocentric satellites that is basically synchron they synchronize their orbit with the earth and other wavelengths where you have a telescope is the radio telescope so this is a green band telescope in U U UK so this as you see you have a uh, dish radio dish and there is an antenna which is basically the um, the receive uh, the uh, the uh, this is a collector end and then this is the receiver end uh, where it, all the light get uh, the 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 longer wavelength uh, long wavelength light it's of the uh, the uh, parabolic uh, surface and then um, converges or focuses to the receiver and then they are post processed after from the receiver to see the source of these radiations of uh, basically the radio uh, wavelengths and another configuration is these network of radio telescopes uh, uh, in very uh, uh, which is basically the the configuration or arrangement of different uh, number of uh, radio telescopes which helps you improve your angular uh, resolution which is more like increasing your aperture uh, or collecting surface and another um, radio uh, telescope is this uh, Arcebo which is around 300 meter uh, in diameter so this is almost uh, almost a size of a small hill and this is one dish so this is not m this uh, this is basically not a m uh, di uh, movable or portable one you can't st uh, you can't steer this dish because uh, uh, the the dish is kind of made on the well uh, basically you're digging the hill and then you're just constructing the dish so other wavelengths of uh, uh, light is the x-rays where they are em em emitted from hot regions of um, of our solar system and then our galaxy and then th the universe itself so wherever you whatever radiation falls within this uh, uh, electromagnetic band so this hot uh, hot uh, light or hot uh, hot source emits in these wavelengths so these uh, these x-rays are uh, reflected of the paraboloid surfaces and then hyperboloid surfaces and then they are focused at a particular 
point which is the focal point and then they are uh, exposed on the basically they fall on the charge coupled devices which is also one of the uh, one of the components that's that that is present in our in our uh, gadgets like phones uh, and uh, laptops and computers where you have a camera so basically uh, it works on the pr principle of uh, photoelectric effect so an other um, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so system observations are done um, work from tells uh, basically different fields of solar physics or planetary sciences or uh, extra galactic sciences or galactic sciences are evolved because of this telescope observations at different wavelengths and also you ha and similarly on the earth you have in situ measurements uh, by the fields of geology and atmospheric sciences okay so similarly you have uh, solar observations which are ground based in in uh, La, La Palmas and which study uh, and also in Mo uh, Moi which is under construction so they study basically how the the surface of uh, the Sun uh, uh, behaves so you have these kind of flares and uh, events happening so they study this and what do we actually do with a telescope so basically this is some important question that most of us would be thinking like why would we need these big devices right so one there are th the mo two most important objectives of a telescope is to image a or your source and then do the spectroscopy of the source that is nothing but find out what are the constituents or components of your source that are emitting this light so for example uh, this is an image of a nebula so where uh, you you collect this light which is basically a mixture of optical uv and infrared because you can see the dust emission uh, basically the red light most uh, brighter red light is because of the dust so this is uh, these are emitted mostly in the infrared and the uv band so it's uh, and then similarly the the point sources which are very blue blue point sources are mostly in x-rays and also the wi the white point sources are in optical range so all of this is is basically a mixture of uh, image of in three or four multi wavelength bands and then you make an image of this uh, uh, of this uh, source and then you study uh, the kinematics or the structures of the sources which produce this light and we basically try to understand what are the consequences so what is spectroscopy so here you can see you have uh, you have four four par uh, five parts here so basically you have focus starlight which is coming after the uh, falling after the parabolic and hyperbolic mirrors and then they enter through a slit so here the light the uh, the light uh, the light of the object of interest that is the basically you you allow only light of particular wavelength of particular frequencies to pass through and then it hits the collimating mirror so so that it makes all the reflected rays parallel so and then it hits the diffraction grating so here basically dispersion of light happens so the reflected l light uh, gets dispersed into its bands 
and then it it hits uh, it falls on the camera mirror so basically it focuses all this all the spectrum from the diffraction grating into a charge coupled device and then at the charge coupled device there is an image of the spectrum from uh, so so uh, you say you allow a light of a particular wave frequency uh, at your uh, slit so of uh, of particular frequency of say 1 nanometer or something so you would also record the Im you would also uh, also you would record uh, on your CCD of this particular uh, intensity of this uh, diffraction grating spectrum of this uh, light and then you s make an image and then study uh, its properties. Okay, so here you have uh, after you after you form the image then you may uh, then you extract a spectra basically you have a spectra so how what are the different uh, emitting parameters or emi emitting regions sorry emitting regions of from this uh, light and which emits at different frequencies or wavelengths so on the on the x-axis you have angstroms on the y-axis you have flux and em uh, Continuous spectrum is nothing but the light which comes uh, w uh, from the source without if uh, the, uh, there being uh, an absorber or an emitter in the medium. If this continuum spectrum meets any uh, absorber or or any anything in the medium, then then you have a particular thing called as emission line spectrum which is uh, where you where some uh, some physical process at the atomic and molecular level triggers certain atoms or elements to emit l uh, light in particular frequencies or signature frequencies or signature lines so this is a uh, emission line spectrum so, uh, on the y axis you have flux on x axis you have wavelength so absorption line spectrum is is the part of the spectrum that is uh, where it's absorbed by the medium okay so here ends my presentation and similarly uh, here's my references and thank you